How's it going, everybody? Welcome. You're tuned in to Whistlecake Martial Arts Radio, episode 780, with my guest today, Kyoshi Antonio. I know Miss Tony Fournier, someone I've known for a very long time. I really am excited for this episode. If you are new, maybe somebody shared this episode with you, and you're not quite sure what we do here at Whistlecake, well, there's an easy way to find out. Go to whistlecake.com. See all the things that we're doing. All the stuff that we make, all the things that we share, all the things that we give you for free, our best stuff is free. It always has been. It always will be. But if you want to support us, because we have this mission to connect, educate, and entertain traditional martial artists throughout the world, no matter what they train in, there are lots of things you can do. I bet you could come up with half a dozen right now. I'll wait. I'm just kidding. You could buy something in our store, use the code PODCAST15, it saves you 15% on stuff like apparel or training products or training programs. There's a bunch of great stuff over there. Check it out. I bet you'll find something that you like. Sign up for our newsletter, share stuff coming off that website. There's a bunch going on there. And if what we do means something to you, if this mission to connect, educate, and entertain a traditional martial artist worldwide means something to you, please consider supporting us in some way. So whether you pick something up or you share an episode or you sign up for a thing or you go to an event, you could also go deeper on all the things that we do to get behind the scenes information and bonus content. If you love the show, wouldn't you love more of the show? For $5 a month, you can support the show and get more of the show. Patreon.com slash whistlekick. There's even a $2 tier. If, if you just say, you know, Jeremy, I would just love to just kind of check a box and say, I support this show. It means something to me. And I'd love to know who's coming up on the show. It's $2 a month. $2 a month. 25 cents an episode. Is this episode worth 25 cents to you? I hope so. Consider supporting us. It means a great deal. $2 does help. Bunch of you pay, putting in $2? Yeah. Goes a long way. Now, if you are one of our biggest fans, we call you family. And if you are family, You've been to the family page, or maybe you haven't quite yet. Maybe this is the day. Whistlekick.com slash family. Behind the scenes information, exclusives that are available nowhere else, as well as a constantly updated list of all the things you can do to support us. If you say, you know, I love what Whistlekick does. It's, it's awesome. How can I help? That's the place to go. It's all the things you can do, all the places to leave reviews, all the things that we offer that you should be interested in or might be interested in, all the things you can share, all the other ways. There's so many things that we've got going on. So go check that out. And I appreciate those of you who do. All right. So today's episode is with someone I have known almost my whole life. Despite not knowing him well, and despite probably not meeting him in person, until I was a teenager. It'll become clear as we get into the episode, but this is a story about two martial artists from Maine. And martial arts, when I started training, was a very small community, at least in my area. This is an episode I've wanted to do for a long time because there are few people in this world who have had more influence on me. It's a, it's a small, it's a small list. This man has had tremendous indirect influence on my life. And there are a handful of people we can point to and say, you know, if that person wasn't around, there's a chance that Whistlekick might not exist. He's not at the top of the list, but he's on the list. And I'm super pumped to talk to him and bring you this conversation with Kyoshi Tony Antonio Fournier. So how are you? I haven't seen you in a minute. I know, you know, COVID kind of took a toll on, you know, seeing a lot of people. And yeah. other than that, we just been kind of really focused on making sure the school survives during this time. You now starting to thrive, which we wanted to do was for the last couple of years, just set up uh, a system so that we knew during the COVID that when we came out of COVID, we would start thriving instead of still there trying to, you know, tread water. Um, yeah. So that's what everybody was. I, I'm sure you're seeing that all over because, you know, I, I know you work with schools too, that everybody at the beginning of COVID, and we even put out like a bonus episode where I said this, I said, you've got a choice right now. You can either 
tighten your belt, buckle down and get ready because you're going to have the best opportunity you've had in a very long time or you can just fall over. And the schools that did it, I mean, look at what they're doing. I've, I've got I've got schools I work with, probably do too. They've got sure. the best numbers they've ever had. Yeah, it's incredible because it is the rebound effect that they're coming in at. Yeah. Just people have been wanting to do something and the kids really need it. Because what I've saw for the two years that they've been in COVID lockdown and COVID situation, even coming back to school, is the lack of coordination and the lack of left and right or knowledge of left and right. When you call it, it's always... yeah that jumping back and forth. I said, you know, but then I let, you know, jo jokingly say to all the whole, whole kids, it's like, Hey, you know, when you're going to love me, when you can pass your driver's test, cause you'll know you left from your right when you get done. So, you know, and they, they get it. So. How do you, how do you, how do you address that? How, you know, you've been teaching for, for a long time. You've been working with students for a very long time and you've seen how, what changes in schools changes what and how you teach. How Absolutely. do you adapt to that? How do you adapt it's, to kids not knowing left and right it? I'm going to guess six, seven years old. Uh, no. <laughs> Older? Older? How old are these kids that don't know left and right? Eight, nine, ten, easily. Ten-year-olds. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, that's, that's why I shake my head, too. Okay. And they, they, there's a disconnect that if their left foot's in front, that, that's their left hand. And if their right foot's in front, that's their right hand. They, they, they It's a disconnect. Be, and that's the other thing that gets me, but that's the undeveloped brains that we're dealing with, and not in a derogatory sense. Yeah. But when kids get held back or they have a major trauma like this, that the brains don't get a chance to advance as fast as other kids. So I'm, I'm not, you know, trying to be derogatory. That's no they, this, it's a disconnect. It's it, uh, kids learn through activity, through movement, and this, I mean, as as useful as this is for you and I. I'm sure yes. we both have plenty of other things that we enjoy in our day that are not this, that are not chair based. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Any type of movement. I know, I know your background too, is a, is a good athlete and um, knowing that this is the worst position an athlete wants to sit in, you know, that's really it. Right. You know, it's like, ah. yeah, well, all right. So the, I, I'm, I'm still having a hard time wrapping my head around that 10 year olds that don't know, don't know left and right. It, How do you, what, yeah. do you, what do you do? I mean, I, I don't I don't run a school, but we have plenty of people that, that do listening and they go, what, what do you do? So one of the things that we do is we really have drills that just say left hand, right hand and get them to kind of understand that that idea. Go Even going back to just uh, if you're ever in a marching band, you know that the left foot starts on one. Even certain things like the left, right, left, right type of idea, it, it, you break it right down to the simple part that they've got to actually say the word with with the physical action because that's the only way we're going to get it right emotion mm -hmm. motion you know creates emotion well the motion is this but the emotion has to be that that's my left hand i have to be able to verbalize it and that's the same thing with my right hand and then hopefully a couple of weeks months down the road they they have that final coordination that if you say bring up your left leg or bring up your left knee mm -hmm. and then jump up kick with your right they're actually understanding what you're saying so it's like anything else in martial arts break it down to the the smallest possible parts drill the heck out of it and as they get it stack exactly bingo that's it and if it, ha it has to be even more broken down because of the way the kids have been having to transition back in nobody's had to watch i mean literally a kid could be sitting back here turn off the screen during classes and you wouldn't know what they was looking like um so that was and so now that that's the kids that we're getting in and they they think they can turn off the screen it's like no i'm um, i'm still here you know the john cena <laughs> I'm, I'm here. I'm here, so they can't hide. I love it. Well, I, I want to go back uh, because sure. so so audience doesn't know this. I I've known you my whole life, pretty much. Certainly, my whole martial arts life. Yes, uh, and there, there's there there wasn't much of a there wasn't much of a gap in between you know day zero and day one of martial arts for me. You know, exactly. four years. Um, yes. so, but I, despite yeah. that, despite having known you for that long, I don't know you well, and I don't know your origin story. So would you, okay. would you go back to that? And sure. That? Um, it's, it's, you know, and, and thank you for asking this material because you know, it's, uh, I'm not trying to be hopefully mysterious. It's just a 
nobody kind of really can sometimes. So, but my kid, you know, the karate kids finally get it because just because of the interesting background. Like I'll say, you know, I trained under Bruce Lee. Um, you know, I, I, I was, he was on the third floor, I was on the second floor. <laughs> it gets them, you know, and I said, then I'll relate that I started in 1972, the same year Bruce Lee died, but it was no coincidence. I, it was, wasn't me. So, so now the kids get a chance to kind of figure out, Hey, 1972 was a long time ago. So literally I started karate in 1972 it was an alternative to playing uh phys ed class. Believe it or not, it was one of the first times you saw that. So I got a chance oh, cool. to do this eight week cycle of, uh, uh, martial arts in, for, in exchange for gym classes. So it was twice a week. Where was this? At King King Middle School, believe it or not, King Junior High School back in the day when I was in there. Okay. Um, so I got a chance to do that. And then I had always been always been interested in karate because, you know, I found my karate, my father's had karate books on the shelves and mm. uh, he had studied a little Weichi Ru when, you know, when, it, when everything was first kind of opening up in Portland, Maine, because that was one of the first styles that was here was the Weichi system. Okay. Uh, which is kind of interesting it was but it was it was kind of like looked like an offshoot school of and, and you know when i finally went to a martial arts school it looked you know bigger than their system but their system is really cool actually weichi is still yeah. something weichi is really interesting stuff oh man it's great so i started in 72 um i again always interested watch my you know see my father's karate books read through them get really you know, motivated by that um and then, I, you know, I said, uh, I'll do this class. I did, I played baseball that year for King Middle School, or King Junior High at the time. And afterwards, I I, I was still young enough to be able to try out for ba uh, Babe Ruth baseball. Well, uh, needless to say, when you don't bring your glasses to practice uh, and you're the pitcher, you do bean a lot of people. Oh. So I was really, <laughs> so... Uh, that was the end of my baseball career. And, you know, my dad said, hey, you want to go to karate classes? I said, love to, you know, love to. So that's how that was my introduction. First style of Shotokan. Um, it was originally with Tabata Sensei down in Boston. And that's who my instructor, Reggie Groff, was associated with back in that day. And Reggie, though, he he would he would jump. You know, he would jump from being with the Bottas, the, the Shotokai, and then on, you know, back to, to JKA. So we were constantly taking our material, relearning it, learning it again, relearning it, because he would just jump back and forth. But or Reggie was. We, we got some we got some politics going on in there. Oh, yes. Yes. Reggie okay. was never right. a big politic guy. And uh, he just didn't, you know, I always got, I, I don't, I still don't understand people's mindset sometimes. And um, you know, I'll go into that just a second. I'll just keep sure, sure. it. So, you know, Reggie, Reggie, um, you know, was just jumping, but it was great because you got a chance to, I met some really great JKA instructors. I met, of course, the Bobbis people. And just some really awesome karate. Both Shotokan, but still stylistically different. But kind of then makes you, if you're smart, it makes you question why is this system different than this system of Shotokan? And then you start to see, okay, now then, then my thinking process is what? At that point, I want to know what Funakoshi knew. I think Einstein said, I want to see how I want to see things, or I want to um I want to think how God thinks. So for me, it was just going back and saying, I want to see how Funakoshi got to this place. And then why did this group go Shotokai? This one went Shotokan, the other one went Kenko Juku system. And, you know, why did they do that? So that's that made me start to think, okay, what was Funakoshi learning at the time? Then you get to go back to the shore and shore routes and so on. So that was kind of my initial background. And my thought with Shotokan is to try to delve into a, the other arts as well. I got a chance to, I was adopted uh, by Sensei Chinan. Chinan Sensei from uh, Gojiru, um, you know, the Jundukan Association. Chinan Sensei was one of the last ones uh, with Higiyona Sensei that trained with Miyagi, the real Mr. Miyagi. Um, so he just took a liking to me. And every time he, I'd see him at like a national event, the national tournaments, he'd always take me with them wherever they went. And I would practice Gojiru with them. So I got lucky to get some good go to practice with Chin and Sensei. And I had a good relationship, brought him, you know, I, he, I was bringing him to my karate school as well to train. So we, we've had some really good openings because of all the different martial arts that we've been able to do. And then uh, Soke Ruiz, who is my instructor now, he, um, the same thing. He's the Shitaru aspect of martial arts really was kind of an interesting because 
to me, it's a, it's an encyclopedia of all the different kata. If you can stick with it long enough to find them all, yeah. all the different ones, but it was just it's a beautiful art form to to think about, um, and that opened my mind a little bit more to to what Funakoshi was thinking and how he got from where he was to there so mm. that was my initial then you know reggie was also kind of visionary back in the day he he was the first one to bring uh mr che in from korea um mr che was a um you know sung Luke che was his name brought him over i think in 1974 frank thibodeau brought him over uh and i always tell people i said i thought i knew what fast was until i saw him and there was a whole new level of fast that i never saw before mm. uh, and we saw some very fast karate guys, but because his background, of course, was Taekwondo, he was incredible, absolutely incredible. Fast hands, fast feet, fast body, fast mind. Um, he, he just was absolutely amazing and, and what he could do and how hard he could train you. So I got a chance mm -hmm. to be with him for a little while before he split off with Reggie. And then Reggie kind of just dissolved classes. So I kind of kept on, uh, I joined the National Karate and Jiu-Jitsu Union back in the day and. I uh, kept on expanding, you know, my martial arts as far as Hakuru Aiki Jiu Jitsu. So I have a first degree black belt and I wanted to test through two people. I wanted to test through my original instructor, who was Sean Stroud, uh, North Carolina. And then I wanted to teach with, Den uh, get my degree with Dennis Palumbo, who was the, who was my uh, Hakuru instructor at the time. So I tested under Mr. Palumbo, got my first degree black belt from that. But it was always in my mind that I wanted to test also with uh, Sean Stroud. So a couple of years later, I got a chance to get in front of him and and show him and re, and retest basically, but also to get my first degree under him as well. So that was you're why you're talking I about cross training when there really wasn't a lot of cross training. I mean, we saw cross training. You know, I've, I've had plenty of folks on who, who were you know pushing up in age, and they talk about the '50s and the '60s. You know, where it was just oh, you know a thing, and it was just very open, right? Kind yes. and we're kind of getting back to that. But it seems like in the late 60s, definitely the 70s and the 80s, there were these rigid walls up and we had, you know, dojo wars and all this stuff. Okay. That maybe it wasn't as bad as some people make it out to be, but it, but the culture was not, I'm going to do this and this and this. It was, you do this with me and you kiss the ring, otherwise you're out. Exactly. And that's and that's how it was back in that, that day. Um, the schools were against schools. It was not you know, the, the, the kind of like the camaraderie now that we have, you know, that we can actually share stories, talking to each other. You know, some of my best friends, unfortunately, they passed away. This is Jeff, Ye Jeff Wood's two-year anniversary uh, of his passing. So um, John Jenkins was, it would be two years, it was two years last September. So uh, these were great guys, but, you know, we were at war with them. You know, they were, they were not sparring pads at the time. The Jun Ri stuff did not come out at that time so you you had some really weird looking pads on your hands if you wore pads at all right. and the jka was always no pads you know just all bare knuckle and you take the abuse and you keep on going from there and you get great side profiles and that kind of good thing and uh, <laughs> you know, it, it's but it was a little bit more brutal and it was more personal um and that's that's that was a shame because it it took a little while for everybody to kind of open up like even trying to learn how to do go shooters like oh no shoulder count's better you know and weichi now i can't learn weichi yeah shoulder count is so much better right and having that mentality versus saying well you know everything has a little bit of you know meaning to it uh, uh one big opening eye for me as far as the jka was concerned was i think that's just a it's just like a dogma institution or everything else but the instructors were not and i remember nonaka sensei and I were watching um, oh, Domingo Llanos. Mm -hmm. And this is when Domingo had just lost by like one one hundredth of a point in the world's championships against Sugimoto. So I remember Nonaka, somebody had a video of him, you know, Domingo doing Superempe. But I watched my, the gentleman, Nonaka sensei, would not be bothered he would he was watching this he did not want to see anything else he was really interested in what domingo was doing and that kind of opened my eyes that they 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 do kind of you know, they do want to open their eyes a little bit more to different things um and that that was one of my big eye openers it's like it's not just this way too you can appreciate gojuno you can appreciate uh that the 
the Weichi systems, the Ishiru systems, and every every system that's out there. And then, then we, of course, we opened. I, you know, when I'm doing things, I started looking at Kali, um, you know, and doing that loosely because Shotokan is no weapon system. So I had to learn, re- learn Kabuto. Um, so we, we looked for a lot of different paths. And then I saw the value of Krav Maga when I first saw it back in 80, 81. Oh, excuse me, take that back up, 90, 91. About that time slot, I started seeing the value of crop, especially since Shotokan did not have at the time a lot of application work to it. Um, you know, we, we come up, it, sparring was awesome. You know, Kata was awesome, but it always looked separate from each other. Yeah. Uh, until I met Wei Chiru, then you saw they actually spar like they, they do Kata, which was really kind of fun uh, to, able to, to be able to watch. Um, but I, you know that they, they was separate between the kata and the kumite, but but you needed that learning that application. To me, that application was what I was starting to find in the Haganah system as well with um, Mike Lee Kanarik in the Krav Maga, two Israeli great systems. So, so for me, that was a door, you know, door opener for me to t- kind of look at other styles. Okay, and see how it now fit into my Shotokan. So that idea of shuhari for you really get that. And then you start adding into the system and building the system and then showing people where in Shultakan is the same thing. Mm-hmm. And that's what we're doing now with some Penchak Silat as well, um, is to see, show people that, look, this is this is in your karate. This is not, it's not so foreign to you. I mean, I'm just trying to get it palatable. I, I have friends that... Um, we we both might like musical forms and we like musical weapons, right? And I you you know some of the friends that I know too as well that if you see them the kids out there throwing a bow up in the air, yeah, see people losing their mind. <laughs> These kids and you know doing that, it's like oh my god, as as if as if the ability to manipulate that bow in these dramatic fashions somehow means that they can't do any of the fundamentals. Exactly. And somehow they found a way to jump over all that, and <laughs> and all they can do is twirl it like a baton. They don't actually have the skill to put the end of that thing in your forehead whenever they want. Exactly. Oh yeah. So and you know what I I you know I still had a few black belt holdouts of you know that mentality. I said, well, let's let's go take a look. And thank God for YouTube. You get on there, you get a military precision drill unit with rifles, and you watch them. Why are they throwing that rifle in the air? That's well, a perfect good rifle. Why are they throwing it? So if you look at the military drill units and what they're doing, you know they're not there, to, but the precision that they move is absolutely amazing. So when you take a look at the kata, and believe it or not, when you're watching that military, that's a kata. They're just doing some really beautiful kata. Um, but when you see them doing all those twirling up, catching them, boom, restocking, and back, and you're not impressed with that, well, that's what I look at when we're doing our martial arts weapons. And I see the kids doing that. You know, it's nice if they throw some actual martial technique in with it. And that's one of the things I always try to stress with my people is that, yeah, you can do the open tournament part of it, learn some, but learn the traditional art too, so that you have the traditional base. So if somebody says, what is this? You actually can say, this is what I'm doing. And that you, you know, don't go, well, I don't know I'm doing this. I'm throwing it up in the air. And so we wanted to do both and then, and have the appreciation for the kids that can twirl. So absolutely. I, we're, we're on the same page. Yes. on that you know why why do we learn how to do jump spinning kicks yes not super practical probably no. one in a million that i might ever use that in a self-defense situation maybe one in a hundred i would use it in a competition situation yes but if i can do those techniques i could probably do a standing one a lot better i could probably do a, a, a grounded spinning one better i probably have a better understanding of balance and timing and all these other things that really do serve me no matter what the application. And I'm I'm 100% agreeing because what I always try to tell them to understand is even if you can't do this, at least if you know about it, you're not going to get hit by it, right? When when does a dog know that a car is dangerous? Well, after it gets hit, well, that's kind of a little too late. You know, if you're at least seeing the spinning, jump spinning, what kick, and you can try to do the jump, you probably have less chance of being hit by it now because you actually know what it is. So it, it, you have that other back part of it that goes with it. They got to be able to have both. Now, you know even better than I do that the majority of people who start training don't keep training. And you, you, you could probably go back and actually get us some really good statistical information on where people drop out and everything. 
Of course, you did not. And what I find when we have someone on the show who's been training for a long time. 50 years. So you, 50 oh, years. Oh, that's awesome. 50 years. There's usually, a, a, maybe not quite a moment, but a fairly short period of time where martial arts went from, this is a thing I'm doing to, this is who I am. Mm. Do yes. you remember that? Is, is there a story there or a time where you went, I get it now. I see what's happening. I think I was in my 20s when I, that finally started to kick in. Um, and I had somebody interviewed me. It was on the press. And I and they said, they asked that question, what happens once your career is over? And I, but at the very end of it was that idea of, well, you know, my career might be over, but I can also still be able to teach this. And that'd be one of the greatest loves I could ever do was to be able to give back what I've loved to do. And I think that's what helped me flip the switch that this is, this has got to be more and stronger for us uh, as educators in the martial arts to actually love what we're doing. So, and the people can see that we love what we're doing, right? You know, Dr. Wayne Dye used to say it the best, love what you do, sell what you love. You want to be a great salesman? Very simple so solution. Love what you do, sell the love for that. So the same thing as an instructor, I have an absolute love for martial arts. I know you do as well. Um, then let's communicate that. Let's show that love to the world, how much we love this, what you're going to do. Uh, every great thing in my life came from me being able to get my black belt. So I want that same opportunity for you. And I know we also relate stories, you know, about my daughters, you know, being able to protect themselves. Well, I want the same thing for you. So at some point, you kind of relate it through all your life. And I think that's, we've been pretty lucky to be able to find, but it was in the twenties uh, after competing. And then somebody asked me that question, what happens after or if? You know, and that was a good thing. And again, I think you said it too. It's it's because of what we become. We're not just, you know, Tony Forty or the instructor. To me, I'm just I'm an instructor. You know, there's there's no difference. Right. And that's that's I think the, the what we're trying to do is we just we so imbued it the, and embodied what we're saying that um it's it's so easy for us to be able to communicate and then hopefully communicate them the same idea. Because a lot of times they 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 don't see that. And we want them to permeate their whole life because that's one of the things that we had to learn, you know, that everything you do in karate has a mental benefit to it. And you have to be able to find that mental benefit. And that's what I've been lucky with um, since I met a gentleman named Greg Silva and Paul Garcia many years ago was that idea of learning that the next step is to take the physical action that you're doing and find the mental benefit or the life skill, if we call it now, but the mental benefit behind what we're doing. And once I did that, that was another huge yeah. key, key element in my training was, was to be able to now take it from that physical, take it more to that philosophical, and then hopefully bring it around to both. And how did that light bulb, epiphany, whatever you want to call it, change how you teach and what you teach? Yeah, it was, it's... It, from again, what we taught, we had to be able to open up a little bit more avenues for people who just don't want to do kata. They, maybe they want to do kabuto, maybe they want to do kali, maybe they want to do um, other things or, or sparring. And you know, if you're not giving them um, that little bit of a smorgasbord so they can taste a lot of different things, then you know this slice of apple pie every day is not going to cut it for them. So I had to learn that if I wanted to keep more people and keep them there longer, I could continually keep them training. And then at the same time, give them something new to always look forward to. And uh, that's kind of the, the idea of what I'm trying to do now with, with everybody, uh, just so that they see it. It's like, okay, I can do this, this, and this to help keep my school growing and keeping the kids interested and the adults interested. Uh, that way they'll keep on coming back. Nice. So you, I, I think you buried something really important in there. You're still learning. You're still finding new stuff. You're still training in other different stuff. Yes. I, I would assume both for your own personal interest, but also to bring back more to your school. Absolutely. And I, I think I, I, I like what, Guru Dan and Asanto did. I mean, he graduated, he just recently got what, in the last three or four years his black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. So, yeah. you know, it's like the guy has so many credentials, but you know, for the fact that he wanted to be have that beginner mindset was a huge thing for him. And it's a huge thing for me thinking, you know what, I've always wanted to get a black belt or any belt right now in BJJ other than just white. Uh, and then again, so I can bring it back. I think the Taiki Katas on the Hanchi, Naihanchi forms are all grappling forms. 
And the more vision I have in seeing that type of grappling instead of the stand up, I, I got that with the, with the Hakuru and some of the other disciplines I got a chance to train with in jujitsu. But now what about the ground? You know, if I'm laying on my back, my legs are open like this, like I'm doing a, you know, an open horse riding stance at that time. Well, that's an open guard, right? X stances, you're crossing your legs on top of them, you know, and, so I, I wanted to be able to see that and really bring that more to my students because of being able to see the difference. Like it's one thing to be able to look this way, but to try to see the moves this way is, is a hard thing to do. But I love yeah, learning. It's, and that's awesome. I, I think that's the difference between... Uh, I'm going to say... It I'm a great. There, there, I've had the, the pleasure of, of having these conversations with so many folks. And you can tell you you could you could we could find a way to strip out tone of voice so nobody could tell. But if you look at the words, if you look at what I call you know a white belt mindset, you know very much this this attitude that that I think in Asanto, if he didn't pioneer it, I think he is best the best known example of it. Absolutely, you can tell from what people say, and then we could find a way to score rate martial artists I, I think you're gonna find that the ones who have that attitude what else where else who else give me more even if it's not because i want to formally cross train and earn rank over here but just so i can better understand my art what i do exactly there there's a lot of development in that yes and i think that's a huge thing is that, you know if your mind's not constantly expanding then you, you know you're contracting right that's mm. that's it so you know the, the best phrase is that uh, your mind is like a parachute they both work better when they're open so for me i just wanted to see different things now and um and, and again like you said be able to bring it back into my my own kata and, and for my own edification why did uh, going back to Choki Motobu, Motobu Sensei only had to know those three katas, but he was were considered the world's greatest fighter. Uh, there's something in it more that we're not necessarily always seeing. And I, I think that is a, uh, interesting, always interesting for me is that why aren't we getting that? Why don't we understand that a little bit better? Now you, you brought up your daughters yes. a couple times. Yes, and lovely. Grandchildren. Great, I, 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 I know them. I know them a little bit, actually. How how old? Maria, I, I, yeah. I've Maria's watched your grandchildren born on on social media. Essentially. Yes, yes, I've, yes. I've gotten to see that, so that's kind of cool. Was it important to you that they train? Was it an option, or did they have um, to? They they constantly had to be in the dojo, so they might as well be training. So both of them did get their black belt. Uh, Maria just loves, you know, she's on the floor with me. She's probably more, more, more quote unquote, call a business partner now versus just somebody that's, you know, my daughter. Um, so that type of idea is making sure that we always leave things in good hands. And then my other daughter, you know, it was kind of not that much fun until she started learning how to compete. Then once she started competing, uh, we couldn't keep away from tournaments. She was training hard. She was, you know, she liked to do the demo team practice, the demo team competition, but then she, she loved to do sparring. So, you know, that type of thing. But then her desire was to become a hairstylist. She works for Madeline's hair replacement. This is no reflection <laughs> on, on their quality of work. So, uh, yeah, but that was a career. Maybe we can get a two for one. I, we could, you know, didn't think of it that way. I don't know how much super glue they would have to put on a head. So that's the only thing. It's like, I don't know, it'd be hard. But that that was that was it. They had to. My wife is also a black belt too. Uh, her biggest hurdle was bowing to me. So, you know that I yeah I said what well, I said bow. It's not like obeying I, you know blindly. It's just a sign of respect for one another, like they do in the military. They salute. We do handshakes. We, you know, I said so. We just bow as a sign of respect. It's not obedience. Yeah. So, getting past the, that was a hard, hot hurdle. But when she did. She ended up getting her black belt as well. So it was, it was like to have a whole black belt family. Um, and, and, you know, that's the, and that's helped them with a lot of things in life because they learned how to have a work ethic. They saw me have to work a long time. I had to work at my father's donut shop. Um, it was a seven day a week operation. So I was there seven days a week. So learning about making the world's best donuts, which we were. 
and still are. And we still have great donuts. Uh, so I'm not there making them, but uh, other things to do. So, but I learned a work ethic. And that was one thing that I always try to pass on to both, excuse me, my daughters and everybody here and all my karate students as well. Was I now, I, at that time, you know, I hated working seven days a week. Mm-hmm. Hated working double shifts because, you know, you're a family business. And if somebody doesn't show up, you've got to double it up. Or you're so busy that, you know, you're really doing the work of two people even before the day begins. Um, so I, they, they got a chance to see that you could, you could, you could work through these things. I figured out by the time I was done working seven days a week, I said, not liking it, but you know what, it, as far as my competition was concerned, if I knew my competition was working six days a week, I could work seven. I already know I can. Yep. Right. And I could keep on doing that whole thing. And I, I don't care if you want to, you, if you're up at three you know, at, uh, if you're up at 5.00 AM, I'm up at 4.00 AM working i always understood to do that little extra and that's what i got from the business skills of just having to work seven days a week i mean the only day off we had was thanksgiving that was the only day i would set my alarm because i could roll over and go turn that thing off so the rest of it i was always up and, and going but it was the only time so at 3 30 was you know that it, just like the commercials time to make the donuts mm-hmm. uh that was it. but again it did teach me to have a great work ethic um I missed a few things and, and that maybe would, would have been a good thing. And, you know, uh, but again, family responsibility, like I was one of the first athletes to be chosen to go to Colorado uh, at the, at the training center before karate was in the Olympics. But in you know, my daughter, Maria had just been born, um, you know, I got, karate, I was running the karate school plus banking donuts in the morning, you know, for my dad. And um, so there were just family obligations were not allowing me to go, to the training center, but it was, it was great to have that offer. And like I said, maybe it would have been a good thing. Maybe not. So can't worry about it now. And it's, a, that's right. what I always tell it's in the past. And I don't live with regret. I have no regrets for anything. Um, and I think I tell everybody this too. I have one of the great things is to uh, two types of discipline and then two types of pain. We're all going to you know, suffer in life, the pain of discipline and pain of regret. Um, I choose not to live my life with regret. You know, I, I, I do sometimes with a little bit of remorse, but no regrets of mm-hmm. anything good, bad, ugly, whatever it is, no regrets. You know, if I have to make atonements to people, I can constantly always try to work on making atonements to people that I've ever wronged in the past. Um, but again, I, I don't want to sit there with regret. It's just too heavy. It's just too heavy. I'll just keep on disciplining myself to do the things nobody else wants to do. Exactly. And, and, I'll be I'll be delicate with this. Uh, sure. You've been training for fifty years, so folks sure. can infer whatever they want from from that and and adding numbers together. You're not slowing down. There's nothing that I'm aware of with you where you're slowing down. Maybe you're not getting up at three thirty in the morning anymore. 5:30. But five thirty, okay, it's still earlier than the vast majority of the world. Yes. Why? Good question. So here we coming up to January. We got great goal get, goal setting. I set crazy goals for myself. So the why is very simple. I want to be at my great grandchildren's wedding. Now my grandchild uh, Sunny, the oldest one, is five. My granddaughter's three, and my other grandson is nine months. So you know that's twenty years of their life they have to live. So now that's twenty on top of sixty-four. So now I'm I'm up to eighty-four, and then by the time their children they have children and their children get to be that age, I, I figure I got to be one hundred and twenty-eight and still be at their wedding. So that's my crazy goal is to be at my grandchildren, my great grandchildren's wedding. The second one, I, I like working out because it, um, this is why I used to like competing. It wasn't the fact that I wanted to compete anymore, but it, competing does have a way to try to keep you sharp because you always have something to move to. So I had to learn, uh, instead of thinking about competition, what can I do to make myself better? And that's that's what I try to do. So my competition is always daily. Do I get in that gym or I don't get in that gym? So at 64, I want to be able to keep on cranking. And, and, if, and if folks if folks are listening and, and not watching, I don't know if we're doing this one in video too, but that's... Uh... That's a substantial bicep. Thank you. Thank you. And it's one of the things I love doing. I, I love at this age, I want to be, I want to be that guy when he takes off the shirt and everybody goes, Jesus, he looks like he's 90. Right. You know, that's, that's the look that, I, that, that I've always liked. Is that I feel like, but if I needed it to, to, to work, this is the other thing too, mm-hmm. in which it does. And it's still muscle that's useful muscle. And that's really what I want to do. Keeps me sharp, keeps me faster than everybody else. Um, and, you know, 
reaction time doesn't have to slow as much as we want to. This might, the chemical electrical stimulation might slow down, but if you keep your muscles at a high rev and a high, you can react to situations better and faster. And I think a lot of, keep going, sorry. Oh, I'm just going to say better than people that are sedentary. Exactly. A lot of what we chalk up to, and you, you not only know this, but are clearly illustrating this, a lot of what we chalk up to getting older is really living poorly. Yes. Poor food choices, poor activity choices, poor lifestyle mindset choices, and it takes a toll on you. Yeah, you can you can live on junk in every way you could mean that when you're in your teens and 20s, yes. and the deterioration doesn't become noticeable. But the opposite is also true. If you stay healthy, I mean, I'm 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 43 now. I know yes. I don't act it. Most people don't. Most people think I'm in my early 30s. So I, I'm, you know, uh, I don't have the specific, you know, 128 great grandchildren's wedding. But I, yes. I'm I'm along for the same sort of ride. You know, I, yes. I I like being able to step out on the floor and hang with the with the 20 year olds and say, you know what, yeah, I can yeah. I can hang with you physically, and I got 20 years of training on you. Exactly. And that that's a great opportunity for us, too, to be able to stay sharp. That's why I used to love going to tournaments, because I got a chance to be able to stay in my division, but at the same time, then work my way down, get into the grants, and then you got to be up against the kids. And you, yeah. you got to figure out what they're doing and how they're doing it. So that was the other thing, too, is to watch what everybody else is doing on the circuit and then just try to figure a way to shut that down as fast as possible uh, and then and pass that on to the students as well. So I, I, I still love doing it. I, I love competing. Um, but I, I do set crazy goals. I want to be able to do a pull up with my wife on my back. I don't know what that means, but uh, you know, the, the 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 highest weight I've ever done is I did a one pull up with an eighty pound girl on my back. Okay. So, so if I, I can either get my wife to lose weight or I got to get a little stronger, <laughs> so the, the losing weight's not going to happen. And she's not in the house right now. I can get away with this, and she won't know how to. Unless get she on listens that. later. I hope so. So hope. somebody, somebody's going to tell her, "Hey, you got to listen to you know this time." On this. Yeah, has been said what? <laughs> so, yeah, you yeah. can blame. You can just blame me. You know, we 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 edited it in. We took some pieces from elsewhere. All my fault. And but I, I'm I'm with you because I was starting to watch even my you know 20 years ago before and, and again I, I I'm a you know health coach through Optavia, an independent health coach. Um, not trying to sell anything, but that's one of the things I do. And that's one of the physique changes I've had is because of Optavia, because I started getting that, I hate to say it, you know, when your heart gets bigger than your wrist. Mm. You know, it's one of the things, you know, I see people's heart is get bigger, bigger, but the wrist gets smaller. I've been fortunate, some of my instructors were big around here. I'm afraid they had massive rest like this. So, you know, they had a, they had a beautiful power plant, but they had the transmission lines so that would just yeah. knock you into next week. And then I just start seeing other, you know, other instructors just get big, but they're I've never seen this grow. You know, in other words, they're not working out. So everything's starting to shrink, but everything else is starting to get big. And I said, never one, I, I don't want to be there. Yeah. Literally, I, I don't want to be that instructor that looks like that. And, you know, I'm not trying to pick on anybody. I know everybody has different circumstances in life. Um, they need help. We can help them if they, you know, they can just find a good, proper health program for everybody because it's important to st stick around for the ones you love. It really is. And my other big thing about getting into the health program that I got into was the idea that uh, my grandson at the time was three. And if that bugger took off running, I couldn't catch him. So yeah, I said, I there's a safety change. component there. It was. I said, I got to change. So, you know, getting on the program, I've dropped, you know, I dropped 30 pounds. I've been able to keep it off. Um, nice. as you can see, I still work out all, a lot, but not, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't spend a lot of time at the gym. I, I don't know about anybody else, but I'm there for a specific reason. Mm -hmm. I do one body part a day. And then if I'm, you know, try to take no days off in between, then, you know, I'm going to get double chest. I'm going to get double back. I'm going to get, you know, in one week, I'm going to get double legs. Right. So you know, that's my training method. So I'm in the gym 20, 30 minutes at the most. And then the next time I'm in 20, 30 minutes at the most. So, you know, I, I feel it's a better way to utilizing your time. And here's a big health tip for everybody too. Don't get on that treadmill first, get, get into your weights first, then get on the treadmill, especially if you're getting close to 50, 60 years of age, we, we do it backwards. We throw everybody on the treadmill. Yep. 
Don't. Yep. People, I, 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 I'm sure you know this. A lot of the audience may not know this. This is something that I, I've been trying to advocate for years. Cardiovascular training, if that's all you're doing, slows your metabolism. And this is why you see people who, who run exclusively, they stop running. They lost, they ate the same. So they lost weight because they were running brain calories, but now their heart's really efficient. Doesn't beat as much. Doesn't take as many calories to run. They eat, go, they're eating the same amount. And now they weigh more than they did before they started. But building muscle is the opposite. Muscle is calorically expensive. That bicep yeah, but... on your arm takes, you know, takes a lot to run and keep that there. Otherwise you starve yourself, your body will get rid of it because it's expensive. If exactly. we were to just focus on weight training, and this is something that I, I try to get martial arts schools to understand that if the extent of your fitness program is just getting the heart rate up, you're actually not helping anybody. You're not, you're not making anybody healthy that way. You know, the cardiovascular wise, yes, I got that. But like you just said, it, it's perfect examples of what happens. Your body gets very efficient at doing things. Don't take in enough fats. It stores fat. Don't take in enough water. It stores water. Your body is highly efficient at being able to do that. Don't breathe enough. What happens? Your body is going to make you have to breathe enough because you're, you're going to get lightheaded. And so these are all things that that, that, that need to you know, be thought of other than because once you start doing the cardio trail and you're doing what you're doing, great. That's fantastic. But it's true. Your metabolism just slowed down because it doesn't take so much because you are, you know, your Krebs cycle is working to its best advantage. Everything's just going for you. But now you just kind of slowed everything down. Now your weight's getting back up and you never adjusted your eating habits. And it's all of the eating habits. And I never thought I was, I was a two type of day eater. I would have a peanut butter cookie and peanut, uh, chocolate chip cookie with peanut butter in the morning. And then at noontime, I might have a shake, you know, a protein shake. And then at nighttime was my real meal. So, mm. you know, I was probably overeating on the nighttime meal under eating throughout the day. So, I mean, I completely had to switch my mindset uh, of doing six smaller portions or five small portions, one larger portion. And that's not yeah. convenient, but you have a strong why. Exactly. And once you have the strong enough why, especially coming up to this, everybody puts goals. You know, goals are great, but at the same time, you better have a strong why behind every one of them and, and have a secondary why of why that why is why. Because a lot of people, I don't think, get past that first why and they hit that why again. And as a, as a life coach, I'd be saying, okay, why? And then it really gets down to happiness. You know, it, it gets down to, well, I wanted to make more money. Then I wanted to do this. I want to have this. I want to do, do this. And what do you get? Well, why, 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 why all the way down? All of a sudden they're going, because it makes me happy. I said, ah, oh, yeah, there it is. You just had to ask enough whys. Let's switch gears. Sure. You talked about your daughter, Maria, sharing the floor with her. You referred to her as more or less a business partner. Mm hmm What's it like taking this this pursuit, this endeavor of martial arts, teaching martial arts? Of course, you raise her as a child, you raise her as a student, and then the opportunity to work alongside her. What's that? What's that like? It's an absolute blessing, it really is, because that was something that uh, I love. I love my family. I love spending time with my family, um, anywhere, shape, or form. So on the martial arts floor is great. You know, going to karate tournaments when they were younger, they all wanted to go to the same karate tournament. So they met great new friends, uh, the rule of Hollies, uh, love them all. Hi, guys. So if you're on here, <laughs> hi, everybody. Merry Christmas. Uh, but they, we love sharing time with that group. Um, so my daughters were were in it as well. But sharing the floor with my daughter, Maria, every day is a blessing because, you know, a lot of people don't, you know, a lot of people don't see their daughter. They are, you know, the children, they move on the opposite side of the coast. And, you know, then they have children on that opposite side of the coast. And it's like, you know, how I, I don't, I, I gotta, I gotta be near them. And uh, for me, it's, it's just been an absolute blessing having her with me. And that was one of the things she's always wanted to do. She always wanted to be a karate instructor and nothing I had to force her into doing. This is something that she wanted to do and and sharing it is just an absolute blessing. And I'm sure anybody that's here or on here that might be listening and you're working with uh, one of your, your, your prodigies, if you want, um, is that you get the blessing of being with them every day. You get the blessing of also being able to see your grandchildren more frequently, which I do. Um, so these are the things for me that just has been an absolute benefit. And watching her grow professionally is, 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 is huge. I mean, she, you know, she was, 
uh, very smart girl. She's still a very smart girl, you know, graduated degree in economics. So, you know, she understands a lot of things, but just to see her become what she has become mm. so far is, is just, uh, it's, it's a priceless thing to be able to see it on a constant basis. Priceless. How has she made you and or the school better? Very simple. Uh, she makes me better uh, because she's probably the kindest hearted person uh, in this world. And, you know, uh, Fraulein Maria would be the closest I can think of. If you think go to the sound of music, you know, that is Maria. You know, she has that same Fraulein Maria fun when kids see her. She's they're lively. They they see me show up. They they start shedding tears. Uh, <laughs> But she is just, uh, she is just Fraulein Maria. So um, that that's just been, you know, one of the great things that made me better because when I see everybody else's children's faces, I then imagine Maria's little face in their face. Mm-hmm. So I, I caught, that's how it made me better at the beginning. It's like, what kind of instructor would I want in front of my daughter? What kind of instructor would I want in front of my parents? What kind of instructor would would want in front of my siblings. That's the instructor I always wanted to be. And by having her literally there, boy, that just literally changed everything because her little face, you know, when she she was five, actually three years of age and starting to learn how to do karate at that age. But thinking about all those years and and then thinking now, looking at the faces of the young kids that are coming today and thinking the same thing, that's still, you know, little Maria's face. It just... You know, that's all. I just project that into them. Now, when I look at the little kids, I now can see my grandchildren's faces because both uh, Sonny and Sophia uh, are doing karate classes as well. So it's easy because now I can look at everybody's children like I look at my the faces of my my own children. So that's how, how does that change you them. as an instructor? Oh, because it makes me like, OK, if I'm this kind to my daughter, then I should, you know, if I'm not kind of my daughter you know you just you look you go whatever i needed to be or the type of instructor i want in front of my daughter that's what i wanted to be so for me it changed me to have to be more patient not look for, and here's the other big thing too it took me a long time to figure this one out um i used to have a test for all the kids you know karate when i first started teaching you know okay here's a low block and on that test i had everything a person could possibly do wrong same thing with upper rising block, same thing with an inside block, outside block, shoe toe, you know, and it, that list was really, really long. And I just had that epiphany one day. I don't know, wouldn't it be easier just to kind of stop check marking them on what they're doing right and kind of figuring that one out? Um, and that was a, an epiphany for me is that I was living my life as a uh, negative person. So for 27 years, I lived my life as a negative person. And I think once my daughter started coming around, you know, being actually was born in 89, by that time, it was like, wow, I got to learn how to change my life around. I can't be, a, you can be very positive. I'm going to tell everybody right now, you can be very successful being negative. The difference is you're not going to enjoy the journey. And you're not going to like the outcome and you're going to get burnt out. So you can become very successful. But what I figured out is I got I to flip the switch. I can't be looking for the negative, negative, negative. I just got to stop looking for the positive, positive, positive. Because if you want to raise a positive child, you better start learning how to do that at that time. Uh, and that's how it changed my teaching is that I, I knew that I had to start changing into a more positive role model. And plus, the other thing that I started seeing, I started seeing a lot of um, motivation from people who had disabilities. Mm. I think they kept on having the person that... Um, I think I first heard it with Tony Robbins was one of the guys who had, you know, been in a plane crash. Um, and then, nope, he was a fried cripple. So he was in a car accident. The gas tank exploded. He, he's burned 90% of his body, uh, survived, then took the proceeds and opened up a wood stove shop. So, because he's afraid of fire. So he sure. faced the fire. Then he was... Uh, flying in an airplane, got it, got his you know license, and he crashed the plane. And I remember reading this story that you now he's crippled, and his wife, at you know, while he was still in the bed, said, uh, "I can't do this again. I can't live with a fried cripple." And that's what she said, and that motivated him to 
get up and become very, very successful at what he's doing. But I think he became uh, like a lieutenant governor um, in state politics. And his catchphrase was, open me and you'll never be another pretty face. So he, that was one of my eye openers about focusing on what people can do and not focusing on what they can't do. And then really how to, to manipulate that. I mean, I've had students come in uh, with no arms past here and no legs below their knees. So now I got to create kata. I got to create a kata that's, that can fit them. Yep. You know, the same thing. I had a student with a wheelchair and all he had was his electronic control. So we just learned how to just use his wheelchair as an object uh, and as a weapon. But you have to get creative with your mindset. So that was my first big thing in it was knowing that I had to switch my mindset. That's what my daughter did. I, you know, instead of the negative mindset, I got to start looking for the positive in everybody. You know, you're still going to see the bad. I mean, I'm not blind. If a kid's got a bad looking forward stance, it's like, I, you know, I'm going to work on that and we're going to make it better. And it, it, the thing too, if somebody's with you for 20 years, they, they bet they're going to look good. You know, even if they might have a rocky one or two years at the very beginning. Uh, but if they keep on training, they're going to look very good by the time they're done. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that, that we've talked about on the show is this arc of, and, and you've seen this, you get the kid that starts eight, nine, 10, mm -hmm. and they're a physically very gifted. They're wonderful. They've got proprioception. You know, they, they're probably playing some other sports and they come in and they just, it doesn't matter what you show them. They get it. They're, they're yes. you know, they're the yellow belt that's doing the jump spinning kicks. You know, they're, they're breaking twice the wood. Everybody else is, they go to competitions and they yawn and they take first place. And yes. everybody thinks that that's the next black belt. They're going to get it. And then two to three years later, it gets hard. But yes. they haven't built the muscles around persistence. And so exactly. they quit. And the other kid that started at the same time, same day, lived in their shadow, just kept showing up, just kept fighting. And and their why wasn't about being the best because that, was, that wasn't an option. It was about, I'm going to try to have fun. And now 20, 30 years later, they're opening a school and they're amazing. Yeah. And, and that's it. You know, hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. And again, and I, and I also tell this to the kids too, I, even the ones like we we're just talking, there's some that's superiorly just gifted. And I said, I'm going to, and I told them right now, I said, you know, I'm going to look for something that's going to make you struggle. Because I think you need to understand it's not a bad thing to learn how to struggle. If you struggle now, you'll always know what to do when you do really have to struggle. So I'm going to find that one thing that you, that you might not be good at, but I'm going to try to make you use it, struggle with it so that you know how to work past the struggle. Because if you never do, they're going to quit. Just like you said, you know, and here's a bad thing about this. And it, from all my years of teaching, I had one student that was very, very gifted. Um, he was really good. His karate was really good and, and as a kid, as a kid, but it made all the other sports he was playing better. Because he was really, you know, the karate has really helped him became, become a superior athlete. Then, of course, as, as, as his baseball, I, guess, I think it was, because his baseball became more prevalent in his life. In other words, things started, you know, there's going to be more games, more practice and so on. His karate practice started to wane. So his parents said, well, you know, we can't do both. Why don't you just do baseball? So what happens? You take off the skill of the karate. The kid that's doing, you know, all of a sudden his skills in baseball aren't the same. Mm -hmm. He's starting to slip, slip, slip. Then all of a sudden he's out of that too. Um, and then he goes in a spiral of never being the same as he was when he was in karate. It did lead to one of the kids that I know end up in jail because mm -hmm. he never got that past that point. Uh, that his martial arts is what gave him the physical gifts to stay with everything else so it's really shame so parents don't pull the kids out even if they're playing another sport my other big thing i always tell parents too your kid you got to stop making sure that your child if he's playing hockey that he's not saying i'm a great hockey player i'm a great hockey player i'm a great hockey player because once he gets injured he has no more identity you know let the kid know that he's a great kid that plays hockey he's a great kid that happens to be great at hockey that way if the hockey just falls out of um out of his life still a great kid so I said, you've got to make sure you're using the right verbiage for the kids. One thing I, I want to add on about the, the multi-sport thing, because it, it blows my mind that parents still haven't figured this out. If you talk to any college or higher level strength and conditioning coach, every single one of them will tell you that they have 
better results and fewer problems with multi-sport athletes. Yes. That these earlier you specialize, the more you set up your children for injury and, you know, uh, um, lack of success. Exactly. Because they've never been able to, you know, they should be able to cross hemisphere because that's why all the sports are really doing is making the the hemisphere of the brain have to talk to each other better. So yeah, let let them cross train. And because I do this with my, my, my black belt kids. Now they're boxing. They, you know, they do a three month rotation of boxing. They get, they did a three month rotation kickboxing. Uh, Now into Muay Thai kickboxing. And, you know, then we're going to learn, take it to the ground. You know, I have one, a uh, young man who's really good, Nick Miles. I'll give him credit. He goes down to Dover. He goes down to Gnosis MMA, trains hard, loves MMA, um, but he loves karate. I, I should say, but, and he loves karate. Um, but he's the one that's, it will take the kids down to the ground and show them what to do because he's a no gi. He loves fighting no gi. So, um, and he's, he's, he's a sponge. He takes everything in. Um, but that's one of the things that, that, we digress on as far as doing that, but that's what we like to do with the kids too. So the cross training and the hemisphere is over. Yep. And if they don't, then you're going to have, an, like you said, a lot of sports injuries are the same repetitive injuries and talk about strength and conditioning coach. My coach for Optavia actually works for Tulane. He's also one of the greatest martial artists and his oh, instructor cool. is, his instructor is James Advancula. Issue room. Um, and I remember Asenio, Asenio, sorry, Mr. James. Asenio. Okay. So Asenio, I, that was his instructor, or it still is his instructor. And I said, and I was talking to him, I said, my God, your, your instructor is legendary. I mean, everybody knows uh, of, of Sensei, even though I'm not an Issue room guy, I do know because I, I, I love the art and I love, love watching it. And um, But he's, besides being a great martial artist, he's also the strength and conditioning coach that helps out at Tulane. And, you know, he said the same thing too. let your kids cross train and let lots of different things, not just specialize yet. Let that brain get out there and develop into something other than what they're doing. But it just shows you that, you know, you can be a martial artist. Andre Tippett was a beautiful martial artist mm-hmm. um, and ferocious, ferocious on the field, but gentlemen, uh, but he, he was ferocious in the ring too. So uh, it was fun to watch him actually do it. And his kata from man, his size, oh, mm. just gorgeous. The way she sings, you know, just beautiful, beautiful. So right on. long, long trip all the way around. If people want to get a hold of you, how, how would they yes. do that? They can do it through my website. Or should, don't even bother with my website. Go go to FLKC123. Uh, Fournier's Leadership Karate Song. The F, the L, the K, the C, and then the 123 at, at gmail.com. Um, you know, they can call the karate school, 207-797-0900, um, and leave a message for me. If they just want some more coaching in life or just need a little bit of motivation. Uh, one of the big things, I, you know, I this time of the year is that the hardest thing to get people to understand about their worth so during this time of year, you know, everybody should understand their worth. You know, the, 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 I love this phrase too. Um, you know, w- when he appeared, the soul felt its, uh, the soul felt its worth, mm-hmm. right. You know, from Oh Holy Night. It's just one of the most beautiful verses that they says in there is that when he appeared, your soul felt its worth. It didn't say it felt its self-esteem you got to know your worth. And I always tell my kids this. I say, if you understand how much you're worth, you're not worth. I I said, yeah, minimally you're worth 98 cents, you know? So yeah. yeah. But if I, if we go to molecular biology and I, one hydrogen atom, split that one hydrogen atom, I could power the city for two weeks. And you have billions of hydrogen atoms running through your body. It's basis of water. I said, so you're not, worthless you're not 98 cents you're priceless right there's no amount of money that can do that especially and i always tell them especially to your parents this time of year you know you're priceless to your teachers you're priceless uh just know that you you have value especially this time of year for everybody you have value if you're alone you still have value right how do i know that god made one of you if he didn't want you to have worth and purpose he would have made twenty thousand of you so if I'm a message to everybody here is you have worth, I don't know what, you have to find it. And that's, I think, what we do with karate and martial arts is we clear the lenses so you can start to see yourself a little bit more clearly. 
I think that's one of our goals. And for everybody this time of year, if, if you're suffering, I feel you. All right, 797-0900. If you need deeper help than that, trust me, I know from experience, uh, call that suicide hotline. Call that suicide. It's been hard two years for a lot of us, but uh, for other things that we'll just keep for a later time slot, you and me, okay? Uh, but for everybody here, I understand. So if you need more help, please reach out. Call the suicide prevention hotline. I know martial arts guys. Some of us think, ah, oh, you know, wait, we got we got to burden everything on our shoulders. No, you don't. You can let it go. There's other people that will help. But no, you well, don't. if you're still here, that means you probably dug the episode, and I really appreciate you sticking around. Thank you for watching or or listening to this, depending on what format you chose. I had fun. I had fun talking to him. We, we kept talking after we stopped the show. I think we talked for another 30, 45 minutes. Uh, this is someone who I just, their contributions to the martial arts world are well-known to those who know, but to everyone else, kind of quiet. And he's not alone. There are so many people who have invested their lives in bettering the martial arts world in their community and in the global community. And I take a lot of inspiration from that. So, Kyoshi, thanks for coming on. I look forward to seeing you again soon, hopefully soon. Audience, thanks for coming by. Please consider supporting our work. We give you all of our best things for free, and we hope that you find enough value in what we do to consider supporting us, whether that's making a purchase or joining our Patreon or telling friends about us, whether you're willing to spend money or spend time. Both are greatly appreciated. And while there are different times that we prefer different ones, right? If I'm, if I'm looking at the checkbook, the money is nice. But if I'm looking at the community and the numbers as this show continues to grow, it's the time. Sharing this episode with someone that you train with, probably the easiest and best thing that you could do for us, truly. Now, other things that you could do, you could have me in to teach a seminar at your school. Do you know the stuff that I teach? It's kind of cool. It's kind of unique. And it's something that is really impactful. In fact, how do I know it's impactful? Because most of the places that have me have me back. That's how I know I'm doing something right. And don't forget, if your school or a school you know would benefit from some consulting work with the Whistlekick philosophy, it's available too. Go to whistlekick.com, go to the school section, check out the consulting page and it will tell you more about it. Everything you've got to know, no obligation. I think that's it. Our social media is at Whistlekick. My email is jeremy at whistlekick.com. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.